Unit 731 is infamous for its horrific human experiments during World War II, and the details are just beyond disturbing. Around 3,000 men, women, and children were treated as nothing more than experimental logs by the Unit 731 division in Pingfong alone. Dr. Harris Sheldon estimates that a mind-boggling 10,000 to 12,000 prisoners lost their lives due to these monstrous biological experiments. One sickening area of focus was frostbite testing, led by physiologist Yoshimura Hisato. This guy had a thing for hypothermia and used human subjects to test reactions to frostbites. Prisoners' limbs submerged in ice-filled tubs until frozen solid, with a coat of ice forming over the skin. Hisato timed the victims to see how long it took for frostbites to develop. Witnesses reported the sound of limbs resembling a plank of wood when struck with a cane. Then, he tried different methods to rapidly thaw the frozen appendages, from dousing limbs with hot water to using open fire or just leaving them untreated overnight. And believe it or not, Unit 731 concluded scientifically that the best treatment for frostbite was immersing it in water slightly warmer than 100 degrees, but never more than 122 degrees. The practice of operating on living beings for experimentation was performed without anesthesia on thousands of victims. These included Chinese communist prisoners, children, and elderly farmers. They'd infect them with diseases like cholera and the plague, then remove their organs for examination before they died, all in the name of studying the effects of diseases without decomposition after death. The horror didn't stop there. Subjects used to study gangrene had their limbs amputated and reattached to the other side of the body. Others had limbs crushed, frozen, or had their circulation cut off. Once the bodies were used up and exhausted, they were typically shot or killed by lethal injection. Unit 731 went as far as studying weapons like bayonets, swords, and knives on their prisoners. They explored flamethrowers on both covered and exposed skin, and set up gas chambers to test subjects with blister agents and nerve gas. Prolonged X-ray exposure was also on their gruesome list, sterilizing and killing thousands of testing subjects. The Imperial Japanese Army even got into studying the symptoms and treatment of syphilis. Male prisoners infected with syphilis were ordered to whip female and male prisoners to monitor the disease's onset. The brutality knew no bounds. Post-war Unit 731 was ordered to be destroyed as Japan prepared to surrender. Dynamite was used from August 9, 1945, onwards to obliterate all evidence of its germ warfare program. Shockingly, the leaders of Unit 731 were exempt from trial because the United States wanted their findings for potential military use. They weren't just exempt. They were put on the American payroll. General Ishishiro, one of the leaders, lived penalty-free until his death in 1959. The post-war cover-ups included attempts to hide gas production sites, and even though the Allied soldiers discovered them, the Americans dumped almost 5,000 tons of poison gas into the sea in 1946. Most members of Unit 731 ended up with prosperous careers after the war, painting a grim picture of impunity for those responsible for these unspeakable atrocities. In 1995, the New York Times ran a piece where they talked to folks who were part of Unit 731. One of these guys, when interviewed, is a cheerful old farmer who jokes as he serves rice cakes made by his wife. And then he switches easily to explaining what it is like to cut open a 30-year-old man who is tied naked to a bed and dissect him alive, without anesthetic. The fellow knew that it was over for him, and so he didn't struggle when they led him into the room and tied him down, recalled the 72-year-old farmer, then a medical assistant in a Japanese army unit in China in World War II. But when I picked up the scalpel, that's when he began screaming. I cut him open from the chest to the stomach, and he screamed terribly, and his face was all twisted in agony. He made this unimaginable sound, he was screaming so horribly. But then finally he stopped. This was all in a day's work for the surgeons, but it really left an impression on me because it was my first time. Takeo Wano, a 71-year-old former medical worker in Unit 731 who now lives here in the northern Japanese city of Morioka, said he once saw a six-foot-high glass jar in which a Western man was pickled in formaldehyde. The man had been cut into two pieces, vertically, and Mr. Wano guesses that he was Russian because there were many Russians then living in the area. The Unit 731 headquarters contained many other such jars with specimens. They contained feet, heads, internal organs, all neatly labeled. 
I saw samples with labels saying American, English, and Frenchman, but most were Chinese, Koreans, and Mongolians, said a Unit 731 veteran who insisted on anonymity. Those labeled as American were just body parts, like hands or feet, and some were sent in by other military units. In the 70s, this psychologist, Harry Harlow, went ahead and did these crazy experiments at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was trying to create a model of depression using baby rhesus monkeys. And let me tell you, it's the stuff of nightmares. Harlow, being the charming scientist he was, built a device he dubbed the Pit of Despair. Technically, it was a vertical chamber apparatus, but who needs technicalities? This thing was essentially a stainless steel trough with sloping sides and a rounded bottom. It had a mesh floor, a food box, and a water bottle holder. Plus, it had this pyramid top to stop the monkeys from hanging out at the upper part. Real cozy, right? He had already put newborn monkeys in isolation for up to a year. But with the pit of despair, he took it up a notch. Monkeys between three months and three years old who had already bonded with their moms got thrown into this chamber for up to 10 weeks. No contact with anyone. Within days, they were just huddled in a corner, not moving much. Harlow spent most of his career studying maternal bonding, but he switched gears, dropped his research on love, and dove into isolation and depression. The first experiments involved a monkey in a cage, surrounded by steel walls with a small one-way mirror. Imagine living like that with the only connection to the world being hands changing your bedding or delivering food and water. Harlow even left baby monkeys in these boxes for up to a year. After 30 days, these total isolates were a mess. And after a year, they barely moved, couldn't play, and were basically incapable of normal monkey life. When put with other monkeys, they got bullied, and some even refused to eat and starved to death. Harlow, curious about how isolation would affect parenting, found that isolates couldn't mate or parent. He even came up with this twisted thing called a rape rack to force mating positions. The real monkey moms turned out to be abusive or neglectful, doing things like chewing off their baby's feet and fingers or crushing their heads. It's like a horror show. Now, back to the pit of despair. Harlow wasn't happy with what isolation did to monkeys so he wanted to capture the essence of depression. This chamber had slippery sides leading down to a point, and the monkeys were placed in that point covered with mesh. The monkeys spent days trying to climb out, but eventually they gave up, assuming a hunched position in a corner. Harlow said they found their situation hopeless. Even happy monkeys that went in came out damaged. These experiments were straight up condemned by the scientific community and others. In 1974, a literary critic called Harlow out for torturing these poor primates, proving what everyone already knew, that destroying social ties wrecks social creatures. Harlow's own colleagues were pretty shocked by the design of these chambers. He justified it by saying, that's how it feels when you're depressed. His students spilled the beans later, saying he enjoyed using shocking terms because he wanted to get a reaction. Another student felt Harlow push things to a point where it violated sensibilities leaving a mess behind for everyone to deal with. So back in 1939 in Davenport, Iowa, there was this experiment called the Monster Study. It involved 22 orphan children and was run by a guy named Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa with a grad student named Mary Tudor doing the hands-on work. Here's the twist. Half of these kids got positive speech therapy where they were praised for their smooth talk. The other half got the short end of the stick, negative speech therapy, with adults basically putting them down for any speech imperfections. Turns out the kids who got the negative treatment suffered psychological damage, and some even had speech issues for the rest of their lives. Now it got the name Monster Study because Johnson's colleagues were horrified that he would mess with orphan kids just to test a hypothesis they kept it under wraps because they didn't want Johnson's reputation ruined, especially after the nasty human experiments done by the Nazis during World War II. To make matters worse, the results never saw the light of day in any legit journals. 
the only official record we've got is Tudor's thesis. Fast forward to 2001, the University of Iowa apologized for this whole mess. But here's the kicker. Patricia Zabrowski, an assistant prof there, says the data from this messed up experiment is the largest collection of scientific information on stuttering. So Johnson's work, despite being ethically questionable, did have some impact on how we look at stuttering today. Now, what were they trying to figure out? Well, they had four burning questions. One, if you take away the label stutterer from someone, will it change how they speak? Two, does calling someone a stutterer affect their speech fluency? Three, what about calling someone a normal speaker? Four, does labeling a regular speaker as a stutterer change how they talk? So they picked 22 kids from a black veterans orphanage, told them they were there for speech therapy, but didn't spill the beans on the real deal. Tudor, the grad student, did some tests and marked them left or right-handed, thinking maybe stuttering had something to do with cerebral imbalances. Spoiler, it didn't. Now, Tudor got to work. She did her thing every few weeks, driving from Iowa City to Davenport, talking to each kid for around 45 minutes. The first visit was IQ tests and handedness checks. Then came the labeling. Some were told they didn't stutter when they actually did, and vice versa. The kids who were told they stuttered when they didn't started struggling. Some even stopped talking altogether. On the flip side, the ones labeled as fine speakers started having issues. Their schoolwork took a nosedive, and some even refused to speak in class. The whole thing went on from January to May 1939. Even after it officially ended, Tudor went back three times to say, oops, we lied, you don't stutter. But the damage was done. Fast forward to 2007, the state of Iowa gave $925,000 to the orphans for the psychological scars left by this six-month torment. The university apologized again, but some still debate how much harm this monster study really did. Johnson's son defends his old man, but let's face it, it was a dark chapter in the history of experiments, and we're glad ethical standards have changed since then. Project MKUltra was a clandestine and controversial program conducted by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, from 1953 to 1973. The project aimed to develop methods and drugs for interrogation, brainwashing, and mind control. MKUltra employed various tactics, including the administration of psychoactive drugs like LSD, electroshocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, and verbal and sexual abuse often without the subject's knowledge or consent. Preceded by Project Artichoke, MKUltra involved illegal activities and the use of unwitting U.S. and Canadian citizens as test subjects. The scope of MKUltra was vast, with experiments conducted in over 80 institutions, including universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. The CIA used front organizations to conceal its involvement, although some top officials in these institutions were aware. MKUltra was exposed to the public in 1975 by the Church Committee and the President's Commission on CIA Activities, leading to Senate hearings. The destruction of most MKUltra records in 1973 hindered investigations, but a Freedom of Information Act request in 1977 uncovered 20,000 documents related to the project. Declassified information in 2001 shed light on some of MKUltra's activities. The project began amid Cold War paranoia, with the CIA exploring ways to control and manipulate minds for interrogation and information extraction. LSD was a major focus, and experiments involved administering it to a wide range of individuals, including mental patients, prisoners, and even CIA employees. Operation Midnight Climax saw the setup of brothels with one-way mirrors to study individuals dosed with LSD. Notably, MKUltra faced criticism for its ethical violations, lack of informed consent, and severe consequences for participants, including long-term debilitation and deaths. The project's links to Nazi experimentation during World War II were highlighted by historian Stephen Kinzer. The quest for a truth serum and the development of mind-controlling drugs were primary goals. One infamous incident involved the death of Frank Olson, a U.S. Army scientist who was administered LSD without his knowledge and later fell from a window. Olson's death was initially described as a suicide during a psychotic episode, but later evidence suggested foul play. 
the Olson family received a settlement from the U.S. government in 1975. MKUltra's revelations led to legal action by victims, but the government often sought to avoid liability. The program's legacy remains a dark chapter in the history of unethical experimentation and government overreach. The exposed documents and testimonies provide a glimpse into the extent of MKUltra's activities, but the full impact, including the number of deaths, may never be fully known. ...would not stop trying. The goal remained the same. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will and even against such fundamental laws of nature as self-preservation. But documents clearly show that the CIA was attempting to develop agents over whom they had as much control as possible. Agents who would perform tasks contrary to their own good. Normally conditioned American has been trained to kill and then to have no memory of having killed. His brain has not only been washed, as they say, it has been dry cleaned. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, subscribe for more content like this one, and hit that bell so you never miss out. Drop your thoughts down in the comments. Catch you in the next one.